Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 367, featuring the fifth installment of my interview with Dr. Cat. Took a little break to bring you a JVC last couple of weeks. Uh, but anyway, we get back into it. We're here uh, talking about the early days of the MMORPG, or it was known at the time, the Graphical Mud. <laughs> There's a bit of history there uh, for you. Uh, Dr. Cat talks about his uh, Dragon Spires game, a little, bit about, uh, a little bit about Furcadia, as well as just sort of what the uh, industry was like when they were sort of ramping up uh, with games like Ultima Online and, and all the stuff going on and AOL and Genie and uh, Sierra's Imagination Network. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Dr. Cat. Okay. Uh, I wanted to definitely talk about Dragon Spires. Mm-hmm. Did, did you use that Dragon Mug to, as a segue? That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dragon uh, Spires. I love dragons. I, I fold origami dragons. Uh, I could have folded one here on screen for you, but our, our Kickstarter video actually shows me folding a, a uh, origami dragon at high speed. If people want to see me fold a dragon, uh, I'll, I'll probably fold one on the 16th. I don't know. I might. Oh, so uh, this is a very innovative, very groundbreaking title. It's called. I looked it up on Wikipedia. They're calling it a graphical mm -hmm. mud. Yeah, uh, and I guess this term MMORPG wasn't even really really around back yeah, then. Yeah, we didn't call it that because yes, nobody had coined that term yet. So well, it wasn't there for us to use. Uh, when that term showed up, we started calling, you know, for KD1. Some people call it an MMOSG for social game. Uh, again, you know, I, I interviewed at a company to do social games in 2010. And they're telling, well, you know, we do things a bit different in this new segment of Facebook games and all. Like, um, you know, we put out what we call minimum viable product and then we do frequent updates. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's how I kind of instinctively started doing for Cadia in the 90s. He's like, oh, okay, you're ahead of us. We were also the first freemium game, you know, in 99. We, our first three years, we were just free. And then in 99, I said, time to figure out how to start making some money from this if I can. And I figured out that was what I could do. It turned out to be the business model, you know, first in South Korea and then everywhere. But uh, <laughs> you said earlier you'd actually had the idea for this game much earlier than this, right? Yeah. So when we left Origin in 91, I mean, we um, we actually self-published an erotic story collection in 92. But the first thing we did was uh, I had met Dan Goldman at, at GDC, which this was back when it was more like a bunch of developers hang out to have fun instead of like thousands of people in big business. I did a talk this spring. I'm like, oh, wait, they pay you to give talks now instead of just a free admission. I was happy with the free <laughs> lunch and I thought, oh, they were going to give me a little money, too. But, um, I mean, it's so huge now. It was 550 in 1991 when I gave out more than half the attendees. I had 275 origami dragons for 530 people. So more than half the people in the game industry that attended that year got an origami dragon handed to them by me. You folded all those? <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, I met, I met Dan Goldman at GDC, and we hit it off. We both thought, oh, you know, uh, multiplayer online games are going to be the future, and they're going to be awesome. We both you know, believe this like a religious point, you know, when we met back in 90, 91 at GDC. Um, so when I left Origin, I called Dan and I said, OK, you know, uh, let's 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 do it. Let's start something together, you know, maybe a year or two earlier than I was saying it's time. Let's work it out. And he made me creative director of Tangent Online and he made me uh, art director and that ended up morphing into Total en uh, Total Entertainment Network. And then it became Pogo, uh, Pogo.com, by which point Dan had long since left, you know, and they went from like hardcore and, and quirky, cool games to like casual games, uh, totally different market, totally different style of company. But yeah, we were there in 91 for a while until he fired both of us. It wasn't working out. Uh, and we self-published some stuff. I did some freelance work on Underworld 2. Um, but, you know... Yeah, Tangent Online was my first attempt to start getting into uh, online multiplayer. And Manda drew up um, screen layouts and concept art for Dragon Spires, right? Uh, and I pitched it to my friends at Kesmai. Uh, I was going to be in charge of the second attempt to make Ultima Online in 1990. James Van Artsdale was just tinkering with an Ultima Online in the mid-80s that everyone knew he would never finish, but he wanted to try and, and make something. And then in the 90s, um, uh, Jessica Mulligan, who was a real pioneer and facilitator of the early development of, of multiplayer online commercial gaming, 
Um, she she contacted Jeff Johanningman, one of our two producers at Origin, and uh, wanted to do um, a multiplayer Ultima on Genie with Origin and Genie and the Kesmai guys. Um, so they flew out and met us. John and, and Kelton were great guys. Um, I still consider John a friend from, from back then. And um, America Online comes along and says, oh, we'll give you the same deal as Genie, same royalty rate and everything, except instead of Origin paying the development costs, America Online will advance the development costs. Uh, and they're like, oh, clearly a better deal. Let's do that. It turned out AOL was just making this up. They're like, oh, if we go and tell Origin and Kesmai this lie, our competitor Genie will have one less service to compete with us for, with, and it won't cost us a penny to, to derail that. So um, the Ultima Online, I was going to head up for Origin. Kesmai was going to take the Ultima 6 source code as the core to build a client out of, and they were going to code a server. And there was going to be a 1990 Ultima Online project that I was going to run. never happened, um, sadly. But... Uh, uh, I'm glad I met the Kesmai guys. Anyway, uh, I pitched it to them. Uh, you know, a few years later, they're like bigger and, and you know making good money. They eventually got bought out by EA, I think. Um, and uh, I pitched it to um, the Sierra Network guys before I signed on with Dan. Um, Sierra had sent Richard, you know, who published Ultima Two through them. I don't know if Ken Williams knew that Richard really strongly disliked him, probably because of not paying him royalties and uh, other shady <laughs> stuff, but. Um, anyway, um, uh, he sent the beta back when it was called Constant Companion before it changed to Sierra Network and then Imagination, mm -hmm. you know, uh, capital N, little, little wordplay there. Um, they sent it to Richard and said, hey, you know, we'd like to see you do a multiplayer Ultima for our new online gaming service that, you know, against the, the, the beliefs of most of the people at Sierra, Ken Williams, the president, was like, no, online game is going to be really good. I want to make this. Let's put money and effort into it. And they thought he was wrong. He ended up selling it to AT&T um, for, for, you know, a fair amount of change. And then AT&T sold it to AOL, and AOL killed it. Um, AOL's history with online gaming is very interesting. Uh, a lot of ups and downs, both caused by them, but I won't go into that here. Um so, yeah, I flew out to interview at Imagination Network. I figured, oh, they're not going to make me as good an offer as Dan and not as much freedom and stuff, but I'll go see what they're doing. I told them right up front, you might not want to show me or tell me everything you're doing because I'm talking to a potential competitor. And Bob Heitman showed me everything anyway, including a tour of Sierra. And, you know, I met those two guys from Andromeda. They are kind of hanging around between projects, thinking about what to do next. And uh, they had just started a writing department, that, but they hadn't really defined what a writing department would do. So the writers were kind of sitting around figuring, what will a writing department be and what will we do and how, you know, now that we have, and the art is like, you know, I, I joke, you like put it through a slit in the wall, like they were prisoners, but you didn't know. You said, okay, I want uh, a character this many pixels tall with 12 walking frames in four directions, or I want, you know, 20 backgrounds, this many pixels and these scenes. And you give it to your producer or whatever. You didn't know whether it was an artist in the Sierra building or contracted out to Russian painters who do oil paintings for $50 a painting or who. <laughs> the, the programmers and designers never spoke with the artists. And you didn't even know which ones they were, who they were, anything about their lives, which was horrific to me. At Origin, I was like playing D&D games after work at, at the apartments with like the, the uh, all six of the fabulous six first artists there were friends of mine and in the office they're hanging around with the programmers and, and every and then you know when we started getting musicians all the time this creative cross-pollination and it's just impossible at sierra in 94 i think it was because they could never see each other or even the, know the point of that why do they have that kind of well segregation you know you you uh, again i'm a big believer in multi-perspectivism most people are trapped in their own point of view and they hear other people disagree with them on a sports team or a political issue or who to vote for or anything. And they're like, what's wrong with that person? And you think, oh, well, he doesn't agree with me because he doesn't know the facts I know. And if he knew the facts I know, then he'd agree with me because everybody thinks exactly like me. That's the only way there is to think. And then you tell the guy in the argument the stuff you know, he still doesn't agree with you. And then you get angry and start yelling because he's thinking wrong. What's wrong with his brain? I am a firm believer that different people think very differently, even given the same experiences and source information, let alone the fact that we all have very different collections of that in our head. And I try and understand it and think through it. So, you know, put yourself in Sierra's shoes, Ken Williams' shoes, you know, his producers, whoever. Um, 
you started out with these very simple, inexpensive games, you know, in the early 80s. Computers are getting better. There's more storage. Oh, my God, they invented CD-ROM, you know, let alone higher capacity floppies, hard drives. Now there's CD-ROM, DVD. You're, you're having to put in more and more art and animation just to be competitive with other products. But there's still 40 to 60 bucks. You know, maybe you're selling more as more PCs. But, but production costs are going up a lot faster. And art is the biggest expense. Well, look, here's these guys in Russia. They'll do a painting for 50 bucks. I get them to do like, you know, 40 of those. I got 40 backgrounds for my graphic adventure. Now I just need some sprites and foreground out. Boom, I'm done. You know, is there someone in Taiwan or China or, or, or wherever, the Philippines, that I can get to do the sprites, you know? Um, and, you know, us Americans, we like to be pedal. Well, even artists, you know, programmers, it's a lot easier. There's a scarcity. There's a surplus of musicians and artists and writers in America. You can get them cheap by American terms, but you can get them even cheaper overseas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want a really good artist like Dennis Lube, you're not going to pay him, you know, a cheap entry-level salary. So, yeah, uh, Sierra was, was, they were about the economics, not about the, the, you know, the creative ferment and the best games. Origin, they were always, you know, uh, both a plus and a minus. You know, you gave Chris Roberts or Lord British the ability to spend five times or ten times as much on their next game as on the last one. You know, you look at me, I'd say, well, I'll spend twice as much or I'll spend the same amount or I'll give you ten games, you know, <laughs> some people working with me. Uh, Chris or Richard, they they make the game have ten times as much art and animation and quality and you know pre rendered three or whatever they would they would pour all that money into a game, and it got to the point where the last Ultima cost forty five million dollars to make, and it didn't earn the company forty five million dollars and and that's a big part of the reason why there there aren't any more. Um, you know there was a Wing Commander that was supposed to cost two million dollars and it cost twelve million dollars. You know, that one still did make money, I think, but, um, you know, could have made 10 million more probably if, if, you know, if priorities were different there. So it seems to be a parallel to the, parallel to this in star citizen, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris is a much wealthier man than I am. So, you know, he, he probably knows a few things I don't, um, <laughs> Well, back to, to Dragon anyway. Spires, I was, yeah, really... yeah. So I did, I did get from 91 all the way up to 94. So um, so Manda um, did this art for Dragon Spires, and it wasn't just, you know, concept art. The thing showing the screen is like, yeah, you could take that and throw that up as the border of the screen, and here's a rectangle where I'd plot all my tiles. And the shapes, they weren't just, oh, yeah, the knights and walls and things could look like this. They were, you know, carefully drawn and, and, and the right size and lined up. I could, you know, load that, that image and chop those pieces out and put them in the map window they were sufficient pieces to really make a prototype of the game, right? So I wrote design documents and I like sent them to Imagination Network and the Kesmai guys. I'm not hearing anything back. And Joey Barra, who was a legendary producer at Electronic Arts, Mule and, and uh, uh, Archon and Seven Seas of Gold, all the early Electronic Arts hits, Bard's Tale, were produced by Joey Barra. But he did Shadow of Aserbius, one of the first multiplayer online dungeons. It didn't ever get quite up to the massive size, although you could debate how many players you need to earn that M. Never Winter Nights by Catherine Matagon on America Online was another early one. That and, and Shadow of Serbius both predate Dragon Spires. Um, but uh, I'm the first one to keep one running continuously for 20 years, so I have that. And I have a Guinness Book of World Records, uh, um, which you should put the link to, too, if you want. But uh, anyway, um, so I figure, okay, even if Kesmai or Imagination Network does this, and Imagination Network... You know, they were busy basically making themselves look good for the upcoming potential sale to AT&T. They weren't looking at new products or improving existing products much. They're just like, I'm coming into work today. What can I do to make sure this sale doesn't get fucked up and really goes through and happens? That that was the company's focus at this time. I was pitching that I could tell, you know. So, like, you know, even if Kesmai picks it up or whatever, it's going to take months before I have a contract and money to start. I just got to start making uh, the game and, you know, call it a prototype at first, whatever. But it's useful work. I might as well do it instead of sitting on my ass. Um, and I wasted 85 waiting for EA to answer a proposal for a single player RPG. I was pitching to them. I found out later the producer was just waiting for me to make it without any advance money because he he wasn't able politically with an EA to get 
projects greenlit anymore. I didn't know that. I got stuck with a bad producer. So he was hoping if I made something or made something halfway, that then that would give him the leverage to, to get EA to, to pull it on. I, I should have just made games. You know, so Dragon Spires, I'm like, okay, I don't have funding. I don't care how professional I think I am and how I feel like the world should be paying me to do my work while I'm working on the game. I'm just going to start making this. And if I get a contract with someone, I always know it's easier to get a contract if you have a demo to show and easier to negotiate better terms and so forth. So I just started making it. I made it run. Uh, Eden Matrix in, in Austin, they were trying to be a cool, back when cyber anything was trendy, these guys like, we're going to make an internet you know, access business and a comic book and, and uh, maybe a moo and, and all this cyber whatever bullshit and it'll be a cool, trendy, you know, new, you know, new wave business and they didn't know what they were doing. But they, they let me have free server space on one of their Unix machines and uh, I made a client and a server for Dragon Spires and uh, um, I, you know, put it out for the world to download and uh, um, there wasn't much to it initially, although I found out later when I met Jake Song, who created the South Korean gaming market with first Nexus, Kingdom of the Winds, and then Lineage. He was in Austin when... Um, NCSoft was there and they had acquired Richard's destination game team like, you know, three seconds after they became a company. Boom, you're part of NCSoft now. Here's some NCSoft stock. Um, I got to meet Jake Song and he said in 94 when he saw the, the little thing in Wired magazine, which Wired paid me for the little announcement of my own game. They paid me like 50 bucks for writing those two paragraphs. I thought I was giving the guy some source material and he'd write it in his own words. No, they called up actually to fact check those things right before publication. Three of the four were still true. The fourth one had changed and was no longer true, but I'm like, try and think really fast uh, on the phone, think on my feet, and what am I gonna say? Uh, is it to my advantage for them to say this? I'm like, I think it is. So I said, yes, that's true too. You know, I, I, I lied to Wired and they paid me for it. Uh, but, uh, Jake said he saw this over in Korea while he was working on Nexus and wasn't done yet. And he saw, oh, there's a dungeon game on the internet, a multiplayer dungeon game. He's like, oh, no, someone beat me to it. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I didn't, um, I, I went out to, like, I meet, met the people who founded the Well Whole Earth Electronic um, Link, which they were, you know, so smug about. They thought this is the first online community. Uh, it was the first one to get a lot of press and stuff, but I had been in online communities on Plato in the 1970s. Oh, wow. I like that, ah, these noobs. You, know, habitat, they, you probably did Habitat, too. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I played on Club Cree Bay. Randy Farmer, I absolutely have to have on, on my stream. He's 10 years ahead of me. I thought up MMORPGs, including, like, you know, I was going to have players uh, who played adventurers and players who played monsters. And to the monsters, like, the towns and castles would be their dungeons. And the dungeons and caves would be their homes. And the players would come out of the towns and castles and raid them. And... Um, so, you know, a little, a little while, like with their, you know, horde and alliance, but, uh, I thought there's going to be thousands of people. And I was thinking about it in 85 while I was writing this pitch for EA for a single player game for the Commodore. And this idea came to me, I think of a technical problem and I think, and I think it through, I'm like, oh, this is a beautiful solution to that and it'll work. And then I think of a design problem and I think, and as you know, a solution to that came to me, I, I let myself kind of drift thinking about it for, for a little while. And I'm like, okay. That was fun. Let's set this aside and finish this proposal for the single player game, you know, back to work. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I, I went out, to, uh, I wanted to like meet with the, the Rockport shoe uh, heir who had bought the well and wanted to make an awesome graphic online service. I'm like, oh yeah, I want to build the graphic online future of everything, not just games, but you know, email, chat, file downloads, messages. And the well could be the place to do this. And this guy has money. I never end up getting to meet with him. I just got to meet with his assistant. But I met some of the well people. There were a lot of journalists that led to the coverage and wired, whatever. And then I got email from a dozen venture capitalists in 1994. And, you know, venture capitalists, you can't get their time. You know, people fight to get it, to be heard and, you know, maybe get I had a dozen of them seek me out and say, we want to talk to you about this thing. So I looked into venture capital. I found a small business administration had this SCORE program, Service Corps of Retired Executives. They hooked me up with a retired IBM executive who told me about business plans, get this book out of the library, read this, do that, write a business plan. 
And I just, I went a little ways along and I like, I don't want to give up the ownership and control of venture capitalist. I want to just stay independent. So probably would have gotten rich if I did that. And I didn't contact Origin about my Dragon Spires project. I spent five years there, been there, done that, you know, didn't come out of there with a pile of money in my pocket either. You know, I'm off doing other things. But my buddy Gary, um, who you know, co-authored Runes of Virtue with me, uh, great ping pong player, by the way. He put the ping pong paddle in Runes of Virtue too, which I think is a little <laughs> too out of place as a medieval weapon. But, I mean, I made all the monsters explode when they died in Runes 1. So, you know, who am I to talk? I thought it would be more fun if they explode, which which I think it is. Uh, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. But um, Gary said, oh, you know, uh, Ken Demarest and, and Richard heard about your Dragon Spires prototype, and they really want to see it. So I go in there, and, and they're, like, ranting and raving about how great this is. And, wow, you only want $250,000 for a three-person team, and you can deliver this game. It was me and Jeff and Manda were going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff D., um, who, who goes back, you know, even further than I did. He worked at TSR and Dungeons and & Dragons. He, he put out Villains at Vigilantes when he was 17, the first superhero role-playing game, which they got the rights back to. They're, you know, he and his partner, Jack, are published, self-publishing that again. Anyway... Um, so they're like, we'll go to an ex EA green light. This is after they were bought out and they'll approve that easy. We usually want, you know, millions to do a game. This is cheap for us, but they had hired this young guy, Rick, right out of college. He had his bachelor's degree and they said, take, take this Ultima six code and, and, you know, art and stuff and make something that runs on our LAN, our local area network. That's a multiplayer Ultima just as a prototype. And we can go from there and they thought, you know, leave this guy sitting there. It'll take him a year to, to mm -hmm. make a first prototype for us to look at. And Rick thought, this will take me a month. And it took him a month. And then they're like, oh, we have this. Well, it say Ultima and do it in-house. We'll do that instead of Dragon Spires. So, yeah, if I had gone to them earlier, I would have had, uh, uh, you know, probably a big hit multiplayer online game through Origin and EA. But, uh, again, um, the, path, the path I took had a, a lot of good things happen. Our whole Dragon's Eye team was hired from within Fercadia. Um, but yeah, Dra Dragon Spires was just a prototype, um, and uh, when Windows 95 came out, I said, okay, Windows is now officially good enough for publishable computer games, according to me, because of Windows 95 and DirectX 1.0 and whatever. I'm going to port it to Windows. And Amanda said, hey, um, why don't we make the furry game? And, you know, we'd, we'd done um, plenty of fantasy games. Ultima, she had worked for, like, TSR and Steve Jackson games. We were like, yeah, I've been there, done that. We, we like talking animal characters. Maybe could have gotten a bigger audience if we hadn't gone for something as, you know, niche. I mean, even fantasy is a niche. Most humans would rather play something like The Sims, where you get to pretend to be a human, but you're rich, mm -hmm. rather than pretend to be a wizard or, you know, a spaceman or a pirate or something. That's... That's for those those geeky gamer types or something. You know, I just want to fantasize that I won the lottery. You know, I'm on Lifestyles and Rich and Famous. So even fantasy is a bit niche. Uh, mm -hmm. Talking animals even more so. But we weren't aiming for furry fans. We knew they were out there. We knew they would come play our game. Man and I go to furry conventions and enjoy it. We're cats. We love being cats, whatever. <laughs> um, but I thought, well, you know, Bugs Bunny and uh, The Lion King and Disney movies and... Uh, Sandra Boynton, cute greeting cards with little characters. And she did funny books with those characters. Those don't just sell to the 50,000 furries. It was a small fandom at the time. Now I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands or millions of people in that fandom. But it was, it was 30 to 50,000 people at the time. They'll come play. But I, I'm, you know, aiming at the general public. And they, they like, you know, uh, you know, sports mascots and animal costumes at a football or baseball game, ads with talking squirrels, you know. I was, I was aiming at the journal. Sonic the Hedgehog is a video game with a with an animal character. Um, so we ended up, you know, uh, not only did we get a lot of furries in the game initially, a lot of people who came to the game because they liked the game found the furry phantom through the game. Um, and uh, some of them said, oh, yeah, I want to get involved in that. Other people are like, no, no, I just like for Katie. I'm not interested in this fandom. Uh, but we started um, letting, you know, I mean, our players patched in vampires and anime characters and humans, Dragon Ball, Harry Potter wizards, robots, everything um, on their own. We added a human character in, hoping we could start drawing in more of the people who like, I like to play games, but I only like to play a human. I only identify with my in-game character if it's human like me. 
And I think we were a little too slow to bring that in. But, you know, you look at Second Life or Habbo Hotel, where, you know, plenty of humans from the start, uh, that, that probably gave them an advantage. At the same time, being in a niche you can dominate probably probably gives you a boost from that. But we always wanted to be mainstream. We wanted millions of players. Uh, I still have an outstanding bet with Raf Koster, who did Ultima Online and Star Wars Galaxies. First one of us to make a game that has a million players logged in simultaneously and playing at one moment in time. Other guy has to buy him dinner. So, yeah. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week for uh, one last installment with Dr. Cat, uh, at least for now. And that'll probably be followed up by uh, my uh, David Wesley interview. I uh, will get into the history of Dungeons & Dragons, the uh, tabletop role-playing game with him, as well as a lot of fun stories about his uh, work for Coleco and the ColecoVision. So a lot of great stuff, so stay tuned. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for your support of this show. really means a lot to me, guys. You have no idea. All I ask, uh, one buck an episode to keep these shows in production. And if you would like to uh, step up and do that, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site, and you can become a dirty old Ratreon uh, yourself. I really appreciate it. Also, uh, you guys, uh, spreading news about the show uh, really means a lot to me. So thank you very, very much. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, so I'll be reading the news today off the iPhone since my printer decided it didn't want to work today. <laughs> Taking Sunday off, I guess. Uh, anyway, Stig wrote in about this uh, Greedfall game. This is from Spider Studio in Paris, France. It's uh, in development for the consoles as well as the PC. Uh, what's interesting is it's got this uh, 17th century setting uh, with uh, magic, sort of a magical world, and apparently the graphical direction is inspired by Baroque art from 17th century Europe. Uh, so it looks really interesting. Uh, keep an eye on that one. Uh, Stig also wrote in about a game called uh, Siberia 3, and I love those uh, first two Siberia games. This, these are from uh, Benoit Sokol, and uh, it's been 13 years since Siberia 2, so this is uh, very exciting news. I'm kind of wondering how many people still remember the Sib Siberia games, uh, hopefully enough to make this one a success. And uh, I'm keep, keeping an eye on that. I'm really curious how much they're going to update the uh, point-and-click uh, format that, uh, of the uh, first two games. We'll see. Uh, and then also, uh, let's see, Shane Stacks wrote in. Uh, this is about Into the Breach. This is a single-player game, uh, and Chris Avalon is uh, writing for it. And don't know, let's see. Uh, the remnants of human civilization are threatened by gigantic creatures breeding beneath the Earth. You must control powerful mechs from the future to hold off the alien threat. So this is a turn-based strategy game. Looks pretty interesting, and of course, uh, <laughs> with Chris Avalon involved, you know it's probably... Uh, more than likely going to be really good, so uh, stay tuned. Um, uh, Pillars of Eternity 2, by the way, uh, it's still going on. Their fig campaign, they're up to 2.5 million at this point, getting uh, close to another stretch goal. Uh, they, they've hit some really nice ones already. They got the double voiceover one. Uh, that was great. And they're getting close to uh, game plus mode, or new game plus mode. And uh, the last one after, the, or the next one after that's to get an orchestra uh, in to record the uh, music uh, from a, a real orchestra, I guess. You know, to me, that one's a little less impressive. You know, I'm fine uh, with the synths, but, you know, that's just me. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is the last item. Uh, just a quick reminder, I mentioned this last time, but uh, Shane of Shane Plays has recorded me and Philippe Pepe uh, talking about RPG Codex's Age of Incline survey and the data visualizations that went along with that. Uh, lots of great stuff there. I'll put a link in the show notes. Just look for the Shane Plays, or go to shaneplays.com, and you can uh, listen to that podcast when he, uh, Shane gets that posted. So, well, that's a ton of news. I think I deserve an ale for that. All right, so this week I've got a Snow and Tell oak-aged scotch ale. Love the uh, oak-aged scotch ales, and this is one from Boulevard Brewing Company out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um... There's not a whole lot of information here on this bottle. It's got a cool uh, label on it. 
apparently they use a Scottish yeast and uh, three different kinds of hops and it's got 6.3 percent alcohol so you know I've seen some of these oak aged uh, scotch ales up up as high as eight if not ten percent so this one's definitely on the lighter side which is good news if you, you know if you want to drink more than one or two of them right uh, so anyway this looks pretty interesting uh, so let's get it open and see what it's all about all right so I got some of the snow and tell oak aged scotch ale from the Boulevard Brewing Company in this uh, rather excellent drinking horn you know, I've been smelling this. It doesn't really have a strong aroma. You can sort of smell some, uh, I guess, some of the scotch uh, from the barrel aging process in this, but, you know, I could almost mistake this for drinking a, or smelling a Coca-Cola. <laughs> it's kind of what it reminds me of, or maybe a Pepsi. Uh, anyway, let's give it a taste, though. I actually uh, really enjoy the taste of this. It's kind of sweet, uh, just the right amount of uh, body for me. Uh, not too thin or not too uh, creamy, you know, somewhere just right in that sweet spot. Uh, it definitely tastes sort of a caramel, but what I really taste is that oak-aged uh, scotch flavor, <laughs> which is, I would assume, while you're buying this flavor, because you want the oak-aged scotch ale, and they do deliver on the scotch flavor, so that's always a plus. I'll give it another taste here. Uh, yeah, just uh, really enjoying this one. Goes down smooth, nice uh, aftertaste on this. Lots of uh, complexity going on, very sophisticated, <laughs> uh, without being uh, too alcoholic. So you could have, you know, probably two or three of these and uh, still be uh, coherent, uh, shall we say. I'll give it one more taste. Yeah, it's a really, really, uh, a really uh, delicious uh, ale, actually. You know, I, I think it's nice that they have a, they really got that, uh, they capture that sort of scotch ale flavor without uh, being so strong that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you might avoid it for that reason. So it's kind of nice to see something with this much flavor at 6.3% uh, alcohol. So yeah, if you if you want to if you like the uh, scotch flavor, you like the oak age oak aging process, you want something a little bit milder in terms of alcohol, uh, I would recommend this uh, Snow and Tell Oak Aged Scotch Ale. So I guess I'll go uh, four out of five drinking horns on it. It's uh, definitely worth considering, uh, but you know, <laughs> I've, I've tasted better, but maybe not at this uh, alcohol point so i'll go four out of five drinking horns on it all right so let's wrap this up with a quotation and i was looking for quotes about cats and i found this one <laughs> of all people uh, abraham lincoln said this and i think it's pretty funny but uh let me share it with you tell me what you think about it, it goes something like this no matter how much cats fight there always seem to be plenty of kittens <laughs> see you guys next week This is Christ, which any fool can eat, but for which the Lord intended a more divine means of consumption. Let us give praise to our Maker and glory to His bounty by learning about beer. <laughs>